Today, hope yes, but rate cuts don't cure viruses. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one of the latest posts covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. As expected, the RBA cut the cash rate to 0.5% yesterday, and the board took this decision, they said, to support the economy as it responds to the global coronavirus outbreak. All the major banks passed on the cut in full thanks to severe political pressure, though through gritted teeth. The profit pressure at the banks just went up a notch, on our modelling, a potential fall of more than 3% is on the cards for the majors, though the regionals may see more than double that. And players like Suncorp also passed on the cut. The government has said that there will be a targeted package to assist businesses soon and before the May budget. The savings deeming rate, however, is now completely out of whack, with even the very best deposit rates available, so pensioners, those on government support and welfare are being hit by the gap. The deeming rate for signals is currently 3% for assets over $51,200 and 1% for those under that threshold. This is one way the government is, quote, balancing the budget. And overnight, the Fed cut in an expected, unexpected drop of 50 basis points. This was the first time the Fed had cut by more than 25 basis points since 2008, and the reduction marked a stark shift for Powell and his colleagues. They had previously projected no change in rates during 2020, remaining on the sidelines during the election year, after lowering their benchmark rate three times in 2019. They, of course, rejected any political influence, despite Trump's consistent pressure to drop rates. And it's become very clear that central bankers are worried not only about the economic impact of COVID-19, but also the losses in the stock market. The Fed said that the coronavirus outbreak had disrupted economies in many countries, and these measures will weigh on activity for some time. The magnitude and persistence of the impact is uncertain, but the risks to their outlook changed enough to justify a move to support the economy. He added that there will be more action by each G7 nation, along with the possibility of formal coordination. In other words, more easing is on the way from other central banks, including the Fed, if the sell-off in stocks deepens and the global slowdown worsens. Earlier today, the Federal Open Market Committee announced a one-half percentage point reduction in the target range for the federal funds rate, bringing that range to one to one and a quarter percent. <clears throat> My colleagues and I took this action to help the U.S. economy keep strong in the face of new risks to the economic outlook. The fundamentals of the U.S. economy remain strong. The unemployment rate has been near half-century lows for well more than a year. The pace of job gains has been solid, and wages have been rising. These strong labor market conditions have underpinned solid household spending, which has been the key driver of economic growth over the past year. At the time of our FOMC meeting in January, prospects for continued economic growth remained favorable, and we judged that monetary policy was well positioned to support that outlook. Since then, the spread of the coronavirus has brought new challenges and risks. The virus has afflicted many communities around the world, and our thoughts and prayers go out to those who have been harmed. The outbreak has also disrupted economic activity in many countries and has prompted significant movements in financial markets. The virus and the measures that are being taken to contain it will surely weigh on economic activity, <clears throat> both here and abroad, for some time. We are beginning to see the effects on the tourism and travel industries, and we are hearing concerns from industries that rely on global supply chains. The magnitude and persistence of the overall effects on the, on the economy, however, remain highly uncertain, and the situation remains a fluid one. Against this background, the committee judged that the risks to the U.S. outlook have changed materially. In response, we have eased the stance of monetary policy to provide some more support to the economy. Of course, the ultimate solutions to this challenge will come from others, particularly health professionals. We can and will do our part, however, to keep the U.S. economy strong as we meet this challenge. As always, our actions are guided by our congressional mandate to promote maximum employment and price stability. 
In the weeks and months ahead, we will continue to closely monitor developments and their implications for the economic outlook, and we will use our tools and act as appropriate to support the economy. And this was aimed to restore confidence in the market. It did not. The OECD indicated that economic growth could fall as low as 1.5% for this year, and the Fed's decision could trigger a wave of easing from other central banks around the world, although those in the euro area and Japan have less scope to follow, with rates already in negative territory. The G7 issued a statement that was, well, to the point. We, G7 finance ministers and central bank governors, are closely monitoring the spread of the coronavirus disease and its impact on markets and economic conditions. Given the potential impact of COVID-19 on global growth, we reaffirm our commitment to use all appropriate policy tools to achieve strong, sustainable growth and safeguard against downside risks. Alongside strengthening efforts to expand health services, G7 finance ministers are ready to take actions including fiscal measures where appropriate, to aid in the response to the virus and support the economy during this phase. G7 central banks will continue to fulfil their mandates, thus supporting price stability and economic growth, while maintaining the resilience of the financial system. And they said we welcome that the National Monetary Fund, the World Bank and other international financial institutions stand ready to help mender countries address the human tragedy and economic challenge posed by COVID-19 through the use of their available instruments to the fullest possible extent. But the point is, no rate cut or government stimulus can cure the virus, which continues to spread with person-to-person transmission on the rise. The latest World Health Organization update says eight new member states, Andorra, Jordan, Latvia, Morocco, Portugal, Saudi Arabia, Senegal and Tunisia, reported cases of COVID-19 in the past 24 hours. Globally, 90,870 cases have been confirmed, with 1,922 new with China at 80,304 confirmed with 130 new, and 2,946 deaths with 31 new deaths. Outside of China, 10,566 cases are confirmed with 1,792 new in 72 countries, including eight new ones, with 166 deaths and 38 of those are new. The flow-on effects in terms of reduced commerce is significant, with more business unable to source raw materials or distribute goods. Across transport and tourism and education, the impacts are immediate, but other sectors are following, hence the expectation of slowing growth. The question becomes, at what point do businesses cease to trade or pay their employees? And to what extent will households also hunker down? Because many are already doing just that. The US markets reacted badly to the Fed's move as it highlighted the extent of the central bank's concern. Investors expect another move in April and some do not rule out a further quarter point cut on March the 18th. The Dow was down close to 3% and the ASX was also down in early trading. The supply side consequences of the virus could well flow onto the credit markets and in this case lower interest rates other than as a confidence signal will not help. Central bank tools are not going to cure the virus and lower rates and more QE liquidity might well make the situation worse. Fiscal responses can provide a little more support, perhaps, though governments seem reluctant to play that card hard. While the Fed may have hoped that easing early and aggressively would reassure investors, it did the complete opposite. So the the sense of the G7, uh, you know, is to... We have, you have seven countries, obviously, and different, uh, different policies, different situations, different mandates, a lot of overlap. And the sense of that is to get together as a group and say at a high level that these are the things we're going to do. We're going to use our tools, uh, all of our tools, in a strong way to, uh, to try to support the economy. So that's it's a statement of general support. I think within that, you will see actions. You've seen our action. Uh, And I think it's up to individual countries, individual uh, fiscal policies and individual uh, central banks to do what they're going to do. I would I would think uh, um, it will be it's possible there will be some more uh, more formal consider uh, coordination uh, as we move forward in terms of um, uh, in terms of moving forward. I would say that uh, we do like our our current policy stance. We think. um, we think it's appropriate to uh, to support achievement of our dual mandate goals, uh, but as I said in my in my statement, we're prepared to use our tools and tools and act appropriately, uh, um, depending on the flow of events. 
But I so the virus outbreak um, is something that will require a multifaceted response, and that response will come in the first instance from healthcare professionals and health policy experts. It will also come uh, from fiscal authorities should they determine that a response is appropriate. Uh, and it will become from many other public and private sector actors, businesses, schools, state and local governments. But there's also a role for monetary policy. Monetary policy can be an effective tool to support overall economic activity. We do recognize that a rate cut will not reduce the rate of infection. It won't fix a broken supply chain. We get that. We don't think we have all the answers. But we do believe that our action will provide a meaningful boost to the economy. More specifically, it will support accommodative financial conditions and avoid a tightening of financial conditions, which can weigh on activity. And it will help boost household and business confidence. That's why you're seeing central banks around the world responding as they see appropriate in their particular institutional context. We are in uncharted territory, and I don't think that central banks can save us this time. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.